You may be seated. <clears throat> Just take a moment and pray. Father, we're so grateful to set this time apart, to have a Sabbath, and Lord, to say it's holy. And Lord, we come in your holy presence. And our prayer is help us be present. Holy Spirit, open up our hearts and our minds to receive all that you want to speak and say and do so we can be changed. Lord, we want to leave here different from the way we came in as a result of meeting with you. So continue to meet with us now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we are continuing in our series, A Shared Life. And we are just reminded of what that shared life is. And we began the 40 days of Lent saying, how can we do a series that's something that we add into our life? And the importance of, of, of how we live our faith out and how that is shared with those that we encounter. And living a shared life is making God's kingdom known to those around us. That's, that's what that means. And, and God's kingdom is in us when Jesus is our king. And that we're to make that kingdom known to those that we encounter. We do that by, by sharing our life with them. Now, a quick recap of what a shared life is. Well, we first spoke about it being simple, that we remove barriers uh, that we create and that keeps us from sharing our life with others, because we create these barriers. I like to call them excuses, but we'll call them barriers. And we create these barriers, right? And then what happens is um, we, we, we don't begin to live out that, that life that we're called to share with others. And one of the things that we can begin to do is we become friendly and we, we're, we're generous and we make ourselves available to those that we are encountering on an everyday basis. Second thing is a shared life is adaptable. And all that means, if I'm going to be adaptable in how God wants to use me, I have to remain faithful and I have to remain teachable. Those are two key things that I have to continue to do. Be faithful in my relationship with the Lord and then remain teachable so that he can continue to allow me to be adaptable how I share my life. Third was a shared life is welcoming. And that's where we say that we're willing to meet the, we're willing to meet the outsider with the kindness and acceptance right where they are. Now when I say outsider are those that are outside the kingdom of God. There are those who've not made a decision to walk in that faith of who he is and believe in who he is. And the outsider, those outside his kingdom that we meet on a regular basis. And what we want to do is meet people where they are. Not be frustrated because of where they are. We want to meet them where they are. And today, a shared life is accountable. And we, we, when we say we're accountable, what we're saying is that we accept responsibility for our actions. That's what accountability means, that I'll accept the responsibilities that I have. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. What's hidden from God, church? Nothing. Good answer. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. Who are we accountable to? See, here's the thing. We can fool others. We can even fool ourselves, but we can't fool God. That's, it just, you're not going to be able to do that. Why? Because God's three essential attributes that he has is the reason that we can't fool God. When, when we see that, that, that God is uh, omnipotent and this omnipotence that he has, that he is all powerful and that God's power is, 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 is the driving force that has no limitations, we understand that, or his omniscience, that we understand that God uh, is just all knowing and that, that nothing, do you know nothing surprises God? He's not like, oh, wow, I can't believe that happened. Huh. He caught me off guard. I was dozing on my throne. <laughs> that, that, that doesn't happen. Or omnipresence, which means God is all present. That there's no location where God doesn't inhabit. Nowhere. There's no location that he doesn't inhabit. Inhabit. So if we believe these attributes to be true, that he is all-powerful, that he is all-knowing, and he is all-present, then the, the one that we're accountable first and foremost to is who? God. That's where that accountability starts. That's where it begins. And when we're unaccountable, 
which is the opposite of accountable, in case you're wondering. Unaccountable, what we're doing is we're devaluing ourselves and we're rejecting the greater purpose which we were made for. That's what's happening when we, when we do that, when, when we're unaccountable to things. And there are a host of reasons why we lack the accountability that we need. There's things like shame. There's things like laziness, a fear of failure, or we just don't believe we're good enough. So we don't want to be accountable. But why is being accountable so important? Why is that so necessary in a shared life, in our walk in faith? See, without it, we hold no responsibility. And when we hold no responsibility, we continue to allow chaos to rule our lives. That's what happens. Chaos is ruling our life because there's no accountability. Now, in Luke chapter 15, we read that Jesus, uh, uh, this parable that is known as the lost son or the two lost sons, and we're going to focus on the younger son for today. And that there's this, I'll give you my version of it, this wealthy Jewish man who has two sons, and the younger, he wants to cash out. He wants to take his inheritance and be done. Some of the commentaries say the younger son could be as young as 17, 18 years old. And he's looking around, and it seems like there's a lot of work to do. His dad's got a few bucks, and he's thinking, you know what? I have this coming to me. I'm going to cash out now. I'm not going to work hard. I'm going to go and enjoy my life. And, and, and he could. He could ask for that. Even though the older son is ultimately responsible as, as the trustee that everything, every portion is given the way that it should be given. The younger son says, hey, I got an idea. I'm out of here. I'm going to take the inheritance now. And, and what happens is he approaches his father. He asks for all that inheritance now. And the father who loves him is generous, gives it to him. So what the younger son does is he catches a plane. He flies to Vegas. <laughs> he rents a penthouse suite. He becomes a high roller at the tables because he's got all this extra money now. And he winds up squandering all of his inheritance. He's fueled by alcohol and, and various relationships with women. And the end result is what he took and left with, he loses. You know, any of those stories that you, you could relate to, no one ever comes back and says, I have double of what I had before. <laughs> it's generally all gone. He loses everything. And if that's not bad enough, at the same time, the economy goes bust, and there's a famine now in all the land. So now he's broke and hungry, and with no options left, he gets a job as a pig farmer feeding pigs. That's his job. And he recognizes that the pigs are actually eating better than he is. And something's wrong in this process. And to a Jew, pigs are unclean. Yet you're not being anywhere near them, touch them, let alone feeding them or eating them. And that was an unclean animal. And, and here he is in this moment, and we could call that rock bottom. We could say that's a pretty low moment that he has in his life. But here's something I know about bottoms. Every one of them has a trap door. That you think you hit a low moment in life and we keep going the direction we're going, believe it or not, we can go a little lower. So he hits the bottom, and the younger brother who's now covered in the filth of, of the swine, he has a moment of clarity. He has a moment in his bottom. Scripture says that he came to himself. I love this line. He, he has this moment. He's got the filth of the swine on him, and, and he came to himself in that moment. What, what we would call that today is he did a PMI, which is a personal moral inventory. <laughs> he does a little self-examination and he remembers his father's servants and he realizes the servants in my father's place have even more than I have to eat. And in this clarity, he puts a little plan together. That he'll go to his father and his re he'll repent. But he's going to come and repent, not to come back as I was as your son, but maybe I could come back and just be with the servants as one of them. And that would be better than the situation I'm in right now. And we pick up 
in Luke chapter 15, verse 20 through 21, it says, and he arose and he came to his father. He went back. But while he was still long off, his father saw him and he felt compassion and he ran and embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. See, the younger son came to himself. That he had a moment that, that clarity was starting to happen and he was willing in that moment to be accountable for his actions. And being accountable is saying there is something of greater value in my life. See, we want to run from accountability. But when you accept responsibility and you're accountable, you're recognizing that there's a greater value in my life. It changes the way we think, and as a result, it changes the way we behave. And the younger son, what he decides to do is he's got to do some step work in his life. It's time he works some of these steps. That he's had this moment of change, and now he's thinking, look, he did the first three steps. I can't, he can't, so let him. That he realizes that I need this change. Now he's working in this whole time, steps four through nine. And he makes a searching uh, moral inventory, that a fearless moral inventory for himself. Then he admits to God, to himself, the exact natures of his wrong. Then he goes to step six, and he's ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Then he humbly asks God to remove those shortcomings. He moves over and makes a list of persons he's harmed, and now he's beginning to willing, he has a willingness to make amends. That he made that list, and he's being accountable to those things. Finally, in, in step nine, he says, Make a direct amends to the people wherever possible. I'll go back to my father and say, I have sinned against God and I have sinned against you. His change of heart was the act of repentance. That's what took place. That's what that means. And the only way to have reconciliation is through repentance. You can't repent. You can't have reconciliation if there's not a change. If we, if we don't understand that we need to turn and go in that new direction, which repentance means that I was heading one way, a transformation of my mind, and I'm heading in this new direction. Well, early on, um, when I was doing a lot of, trying to do 12-step work in my life, and I was away from God for a season of my life, I knew there was a God, but I also knew I had sin in my life, and because of the sin in my life, I figured God no way was he going to accept me. And I started to put the pieces back together. I started to align my life. And, and those steps of the first three steps began to really change me. And now I'm trying to make this difference in my life and, and begin to move in that right direction to be accountable. And uh, um, I'm at home one day and my dad says, you know what you need to do? You need to go make a confession. I said, you know what you need to do? Stop telling me what to do. He's like, I'm telling you, this is what you need to do. And, you know, and our relationship at the time wasn't great, mostly because of me. And he's going, you need to go and make a confession. I don't tell me what to do. I'll do what I want to do. You should go. I'm telling you, this is, you should go. Fine, I'll go. And I storm out of the house, and I head to the church. I don't know what day it is. I don't know when the confession is. But I'll prove you. I'll go do the confession. I show up to the church, and luckily they were having confession that day. A part of me thinks he knew there was confession that day, and that's why he was pushing me. He was smart enough. And I show up, and I had to walk because they took my license, because apparently you've got to pay the tickets you get and deal with those things. So I'm on, the, I'm on the return mode of trying to put life back in order, and I show up to the church, and I'm there, and I'm familiar with confession, and I understand what's to take place, and the little light's on, and I'm waiting outside, and, you know, and I had the same thought that everyone thinks that somehow if I'm going to come to this place and come back to the church, that when I walk in, the building will crumble because I'm such a rotten sinner, you know? Or the little sinner alarms go off and everyone is alarmed. Here it is. The sinner is here. Weep, weep, weep. <laughs> Whatever we tell ourselves that somehow that's the thing that happens. We're so deceived. So I show up and the light's on. Now I got a minute to wait for it's my turn next. And now I'm thinking, all right, you know, I got to do this thing and I'm going to face this thing. And I'm thinking about the stuff in my life. And, 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 and I have this moment where I go, okay, 
Am I going to go face to face or am I going to hide behind the thing? And I remember that half measures avail us nothing. And I didn't do anything halfway prior to this moment. Why would I stop now? And I decided I'm going to go and I'm going to look them in the eye and I'm going to tell them what's going on. Now, you've got to understand, growing up in a parochial school and having practiced confession in my life, when I went to confession as a kid, I lied. I wasn't going to tell Father Murphy what I really did. I was an altar boy. He might, you know, so deceived, so misunderstood. So I have this moment, and, uh, uh, and the light goes on, the door opens, and I walk in the door, and I'm going to go face to face, and all of a sudden I come in, and, and I sit down, and there's a visiting priest from the Philippines. And he's sitting there, and he smiles at me, I smile at him, and he doesn't know a lick of English. And I think, hallelujah. God is good. And I begin to pour my life out and tell him all the things that were going on in my life. And he just looked at me and I finished. He gave me absolution. said I was forgiven for the things that I've done. He gave me some penance, but I didn't understand them when I left, but that's okay. And I... And I had a moment of clarity. I came to myself. God loved me, that his grace was sufficient for me, that I was healed and transformed and I was changed and I was free. And I'll tell you, I walked about three blocks from the church. I never felt that good in my whole life. By block four, I started feeling stuff, but memory starts coming back. But something changed. Now listen, I want to encourage you. James says that we can confess our sins one to another, and I would encourage that. That's part of being accountable, and that's really important for us to have. But what I find is most don't do that. But then we're given a sacrament of confession, which is this means of grace that God uses powerfully in our lives. And I want to encourage you that on Saturday evenings at 5 o'clock, you can come and do that here. Or every first Wednesday of the month, it begins at 6.30, and you would have an opportunity, just like I had in that moment, for something that will, will, will bring that clarity or transformation, maybe in a way that you really need it. Well, it goes on in Luke chapter 22, uh, 15, 22, and it says, But the father said to his servants, in his response, when the younger son returns, he says to his servants, bring quickly, not just a robe, he says, bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. And put a ring on his hand. And shoes on his feet. Verse 23, and bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let's eat and celebrate. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And what did they do? They celebrated. They celebrated the victory. They celebrated the transformation. See, the interaction between the father and the son is an incredible picture of God's grace and reconciliation. That's the God we serve. That's what takes place. Now, Paul reminds the church in 2 Corinthians, and he tells them this. He says, this means that everyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. Actually, he says, a new creation. What that means is just like in the beginning of Genesis, when God spoke light into being, it was new. It was the first of. It was, it was, it was brand new. And he goes on and says, and the old life is gone. So when we come to Christ in that relationship, you become this new creation, that that old life is gone. And it says a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God. All of this is a grace that is given to us who are brought back to himself through Christ. That we didn't bring ourselves back, but it's through Christ that we're brought back into this incredible relationship. And it goes on to say God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Now pay attention. Verse 19, for God was in Christ. What was he doing, church? Reconciling the world, where? To himself. Go on, no longer counting people's sins against them. No longer counting them. But he says this. This is what Paul's telling the early church the Corinthian church, that you know that message, that you've become that new creation, that you are changed, that you are transformed, that you are reconciled into the love of God for an eternal life. 
But he goes on and he tells them this. He says, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. See, we are accountable not only for ourselves to come to Christ so that we become the new person, but he is given us a task to reconcile people to him. Amen. That we're given a task. That we're given this powerful gospel message of reconciliation. That God is not counting sins against us. That God makes his appeal. And he makes his appeal through us. And we speak for Christ. We speak for Christ when we plead with those that we encounter every day, come back to God. And if you're here right now, or you're watching online right now, and I don't know where you're at in this moment, but I want to encourage you as an ambassador of Christ, of reconciliation, come back to God. See, we're called to be ambassadors of reconciliation, bringing those who are lost Back to the Father. What an incredible gift and responsibility that the Lord leads to the church. This is what he's called us to do. So when we're saying we're being accountable, first and foremost is to God. But then next is to the message or, or what we're given to do or the task is that we're to be also accountable as we are those who are ambassadors for him. That those I'm going to see, that I'm going to share my life with. So I want you to close your eyes a minute. I want you just to imagine as you go through your week right now. You're going to go to work or run your errands or meet with a family member. You, you have your week that's in front of you. And there's people that the Lord's going to put in your path. And here's what I want you to know. Here's what I want you to understand. They're lost. They don't know the truth. They've not been set free. They've not been reconciled to God. Now, right now, I want you to know we have an opportunity for them to come back to God. And God's going to use you in that way, in a shared life with someone this week. Church, go. Be ambassadors of reconciliation. And as we go to be those ambassadors, as God places those people before us, it gives us an opportunity. And we can welcome them and say, come back to God. All of that is just as the Father did. So as they come back, we as a church could throw a party for them. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Let's pray. So Father, we thank you that um, you do reconcile us to yourself. That you don't count those sins. That Jesus took the sins of the world upon the cross. But Lord, we do have to make that change. We have to repent. We have to turn when we've been away from you. And that same call to come back is there. And wherever you're at right now, whether you just need to renew that relationship or maybe you're just not in that relationship, here's a moment where you can come back to God. I can pray with you with you and you can repeat after me and you can begin those steps right now with that change in your heart. And if you'd like to know him in that way, I just want to pray with you to begin that journey back. And you can repeat these words after me. Just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my heart and I ask you to come in. Take control of my life and make me the person you want me to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if, most important thing, if you prayed with me with that prayer, you have to let us know because we're committed to a pathway of discipleship where you're going to discover God's purpose, God's plan, and God's power being made known in your life. Peace of the Lord be with you. Just acknowledge one another with a sign of God's peace. And